Welcome back to an episode of the Open Source Cafe. And today we have Josh here with us and we're going to talk about open source. So Josh, uh, would you like to tell our viewers a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Josh. I uh, used to work at Code Academy prior to that Microsoft, and I recently quit so that I can pursue my dream of spending a month playing Pokemon and then becoming an <laughs> open source maintainer full time. And, and how, uh, how's that going for you? Like the, um, the, the playing the Pokemon part? Oh, it's great. <laughs> Highly recommend the new one. It's pretty good. Arceus Legends. Uh, I haven't played in a while. And also, I've just had a chance to relax. Uh, I think working full time can be taxing, especially when you care about what you do. So it's it's yeah. important to take vacations, breaks between yeah. jobs, stuff like that. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So talk about Josh's story about uh, how they're doing like uh, open source full time. Before that, let's start with your like journey. How did you get started with open source, and what motivated you? Um, it was kind of an accident, a little bit at first. I didn't mean to be. Uh, active too much in open source, but I started putting projects that I was working on online. In particular, there is a project called Full Screen Mario that I made that uh, blew up on Reddit back when that was uh, very common, and then uh, I got taken down by Nintendo, so that got me some attention. But really, my actual open source contribution started with TSLint, which was a linter for TypeScript back in the day. I started as kind of a, a small editor. I'd send small docs, typos, little bug fixes here and there, working my way up to bigger features. Then I started working more in the other TypeScript communities, things like other shared static analysis tools. And now I kind of do a lot of TypeScript plugins and stuff like that for fun. So it's been cool. a fun journey. Uh, definitely, definitely didn't expect this five years ago, but I'm happy that I'm here. And what has your experience been like as a full-time SCE, like when you were working at a company? Pretty good. Highly recommend it. Uh, there's a lot you can get out of open source, a lot of exposure to new things, a lot of choice in what you get to work on. But spending 40 hours a week, more or less, uh, working with a team of people really gives you a lot of experiences that you can't easily get elsewhere. I learned a lot teaching people, getting taught by people, uh, working in an organization, um, having a company sponsoring you for an hourly rate or yearly rate is, is very good and I highly recommend it. <laughs> No, definitely. Thanks a lot for sharing. And uh, let's talk a little bit more about uh, your uh, current experience. So what made you like quit and choose the open source for full time? I noticed that over the years, most of what I really wanted to work on was what I was doing in open source and less what mm -hmm. I was doing for a, a for-profit company. I definitely love both of the teams and companies that I spent most of my time on, Codecademy and Microsoft. Uh, Code Academy is a fantastic place to work. I've still been recommending people to apply for the position that I left. But when you're working there, it's, it's for a specific reason. You're building a website, a service, app, whatever it is. And what I've always loved, liked and loved is working with my fellow developers, building tools for them. Mm -hmm. So given the choice between building tools for a small group of people that sometimes get to be open sourced, which is fun and good in its own way, versus working on the tools that everyone uses, things like TypeScript ESLint or TS Prune, stuff that mm -hmm. it globally helps the world and doesn't have a lot of dedicated attention. I was just much more excited to work on that stuff. Yeah. And speaking of open source, like uh, before we move on to the next question, what is open source to you? If someone yeah. asks you, what is open source? And uh, what, what would your reply be? That's such a layered question. Depends on the person who's asking. If it's a developer like you or me I'd, uh, who hasn't or is asking rhetorically, I'd say that it's software that anyone can poke at and probably contribute to. Things that are shared, like a global infrastructure. No, no not that. Like for you. like uh, Oh, for me? For Josh, yeah. Not the technical definition. Sure. Hmm. Like whenever someone me, asks it's... what open source, I say community, right? Oh, that's a good example. Thank you. Yeah, for me, it's it's fun play things. Uh, I get to tinker around on the internet and and build cool stuff. Mm -hmm. It's it's like when I was playing in the basement as a kid with Legos, but useful to other people and much more intellectually yeah. stimulating. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And uh, when we talk about open source, we talk about like contributions, be that code contributions or non-code contributions. But speaking from like a maintainer's point of view, why would one want to be a maintainer? What are the benefits that are going to come to the maintainer and to the others? There are quite a few benefits. Um, for starters, exposure. When I started working in TSLint back in the day before we killed that project, I got to work with some really smart people 
even touching up on the TypeScript team before I started contributing to TypeScript. Uh, now that I'm working on TypeScript ESLint, it gives me name brand recognition. I get to see what other cool people are doing and talk with them about it. It's also a great learning experience. I learned a lot about setting up a project from mistakes I made, uh, both in the technical sense of setting up tests and good you know, code style type stuff, but also the non-technical sense, the working with people, setting up issue templates. When someone angrily posts that your thing sucks and it's broken for them and they're blocked from using it, how do you respond to this irate individual who might not speak your language? So uh, experience is great. I'd also say that it's good for the world when you're maintaining packages. When you look at some people who have millions of downloads on NPM, have hundreds or even thousands of packages that they maintain, they're doing a, a good service. Like they, they, okay. they are legitimately speeding up the rate of development for people worldwide. And I think that's just an amazing thing that we're able to do. And what do you think are some of the challenges that you face as a maintainer? Um, yeah. Time is always hard. You have to choose often how much time you want to dedicate to each project. Uh, Work-life balance is hard for everyone, and especially folks who uh, have a lot going on in open source space, it can be very difficult mm -hmm. to choose between eight-hour work days or you know, extra time. If you're, if you're working at a full-time job, that means that you're spending 40 hours a week coding or doing some similar activity, and that can be very difficult to then also find time for open source. Um, yeah. I'd say the internet is hard too. People are the worst. People are also the best, as <laughs> folks like to say. So when you get a flood of spam randomly, which happens, even if it's well-intended spam, it can be annoying and take up time, which is why it's very important to set up good issue templates mm -hmm. and tooling to make sure people can't accidentally waste your time. Yeah, thanks a lot for like sharing some of the some some few of the best practices. Let's talk about like what are some of the projects you're working on and uh, any side projects maybe that you might be working on that. Uh, uh, some of the viewers who are watching, they want to collaborate with you on open source, right? How do we get started? Yeah, for sure. Um, I regret that I haven't set up good for starters just yet. Um, this is still my Pokemon month. But uh, the big one is TypeScript ESLint. Uh, TypeScript ESLint.io is the website. There's a dash in there. Uh, we're, we're doing the shared tooling for linting TypeScript across everyone for ESLint. So I'm really excited about that. The website's relatively new. Uh, there is a lot of opportunity for growth there. So that's exciting. My personal side project that I'm probably most excited about is something called TypeStat. It's a tool that converts JavaScript to TypeScript and then can also mm. improve your existing TypeScript code, better types. And I think that's really powerful. A lot of existing tools out there that help people convert to TypeScript don't do a lot of intelligent analyses. They, as the community says, slap an any on there, meaning they, mm. they just do the minimum amount of work to get it to function in TypeScript, which is very reasonable, but this thing goes a, a step beyond and iteratively improve your code base for you using static analysis, which is, I find fascinating and awesome as an area to be able to explore. So look, look Amazing. forward to that. Yeah, do check out the links in the description below. I'll mention all the resources that uh, Josh is sharing. Speaking of your like what you're doing right now, you're doing open source full time. And uh, the main question many folks might have is how do you make a living? That's assuming I do. I don't make a living. Um, like why I'm, open I'm a... source? How, how do you make a living <laughs> if you're doing open source of all time? Yeah, um, I've been learning about that myself, and I'm not sure. Uh, the, the general advice I've been given is to definitely market yourself a lot. Make sure that people know what you're doing. Uh, put mm -hmm. your fingers in a lot of pies. Don't just work on one project. Work on a lot because you never know what's going to be particularly useful to people. Um, a lot of open source folks do side gigs. Um, like I'm writing a, t a book on TypeScript, which is going to give me some amount of income. So writing education content. And then I think the big one, the one that's most profitable for most people who've managed to make a living in open source is contract work or general consulting with companies. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're a TypeScript expert and a company wants to convert to TypeScript. They'll pay you one or 200 bucks an hour for mm -hmm. a month to, to help them with that. Um, yeah. I want to say there's a open source maintainer. I forget the name. Maybe the sidekick person who's making like a million a year or ten million or some ridiculous amounts. There's some 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 people at the very tip of the pinnacle have found that niche of enterprise software <laughs> where they can make a buttload of money on it. And I wish I like, had the emotional maturity to work in enterprise software. Yeah. The person who made Wordle, they sold it to New York Times for a few million recently. That's awesome. Good for them. And sell stuff. Yeah, good for them. 
yeah. uh, pretty interesting stuff. Um, and speaking of which, speaking about like companies, uh, there are many companies that offer roles related to open source as well. Like your job is contributing to open source. I mean, Red Hat does it. Uh, so well, how is it different than like quitting your job and pursuing open source? When you work, that's a good question. When you work for a company, the the company controls your time to an extent for the most part and also owns your contributions, which means you have to then convince the company that if you want to contribute to an open source library on company time with company resources, you have to be allowed to do that. And for many companies, I would say this is a mark of a good company. That's not a problem. You're allowed to do it. But some people are not in the situation where they can. For example, if you're working on a super duper secret government project for some defense contractor, it might be difficult to convince them to contribute to, you know, Redux. However, I would say that there are a lot of companies that are really good about sponsoring open source, either with money, like I think Salesforce mm. and Microsoft have just thrown money at ESLint, which is great, or, or, and or for time. Like at Codecademy, um, I got a whole bunch of funding to work on open source tools while I was still working there because it was useful to the team. So it, it really depends on the company, but I think a lot of them are starting to do the right thing. I'd also throw one last plug in there that if you're working at a company, you should try to convince your manager to sponsor open source because that is your supply chain and it's important. What if folks like don't like there are, there might be many companies who are using open source for free um, and open source powers, you know, so many other things. So what are your thoughts about that? I think it's wrong, but I'm not mad at them for it. I mean, open source, there, there are really a few reasons why you want to sponsor it. There's the moral reason that these people are doing work and exposure is great, but at the end of the day, um, for many people, it doesn't quite pay the bills. Uh, there are also just libraries that are useful to you. So if you want to get them to be better, a lot of people haven't, I think, emotionally processed that you can contribute to open source. You can't just, or you don't have to oh. just consume it. And then also there's the danger aspect of if these things go unmaintained or you rely on some random person as the XKCD comet puts it in Nebraska, then it's a danger to you. So I think the problem we're facing is that we haven't properly incentivized companies to want to sponsor open source. Uh, it's, it's just a thing that happens if some people are particularly motivated in there. So you might be able mm -hmm. to say, convince your manager to spend a few hundred bucks on Tidelift so that you can recruit people more aggressively and say, hey, we sponsor open source, but there's no like real incentive. So what I've been thinking about recently is, can we set up some kind of guidelines for companies? Like uh, if we make X profit as a public company, we'll put Y percentage towards open source or something like that. And I don't know how that would work, but it's something I've been trying to talk to people about and gather yeah. ideas. If you have any suggestions, I'm very much open. Speaking of like giving back to open source, isn't it like, can we not also add on uh, when companies give their like resources to open source rather than funding? So like engineers who contribute to open source during company time. So for example, some companies have like 80-20 rule. So 80% time you can do company stuff, 20% time you can do open source stuff. So what are your thoughts on that? I think that's a nice thing and you'll get some traction there, but oftentimes it's not sustainable or reliable. The 20% time at many companies is across all the random fun shenanigans a person might want to do. Open source, internal hackathons, internal bug fixes, that one stupid feature they've wanted for three years but weren't able <laughs> to implement. So they, the, the developers have to choose very carefully what they spend their 20% time on. Additionally, developers are real expensive. We earn six figures right off the bat. That's an absurd, mm. overpriced amount of money. So a company would be much more willing oftentimes to spend $10,000 a year than give a developer 5% time on an open source project. Just the math works out for them. Mm. So cool, cool. Awesome. And um, my last question to you is what is next for you? Ooh, uh, beat the game, watch The Sopranos and any other TV shows folks want to recommend <laughs> that I've missed out on over the years. Uh, play some more Halo, shout out. Um, after that, I, I want to start working on a few more projects. Um, I'm My TypeScript book is releasing later this year, so I have to respond to a lot of editor feedback on that. <laughs> and then I'm probably going to start doing a lot more TypeScript resources, like courses or such online. Hmm. So I'm excited about that. Between that and all the open source things, I think I'll be pretty busy later this year. Awesome. That's ex exciting stuff. And uh, you can you know, connect with uh, Josh. Uh, the links are in the description and stay updated. If you're watching this in the future, the book might already you know be out, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so yeah, thanks a lot for joining, Josh. I uh, really appreciate you giving the time. 
Um, are there any closing remarks for the folks who are watching? Uh, TypeScript is good. Use TypeScript. And thank you so much <laughs> for having me. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks a lot for joining, Josh. And we'll see you all, see you all in the next one.